In March 2018, the Delfina Foundation in London invited me uh, as a collector in residence to spend time in the foundation and in the city of London, uh, where I have decided to produce a, a few events, including an interview with collector Saeb Eigner, who published a book in 2008 titled Art of the Middle East. Art of the Middle East has been on our shelves for the entire kind of period since it was published. Um, and it's been a, a resource for us um, here at Delfina Foundation. So I'm going to hand over now to Sultan, who's going to take this interview um, forward. Um, thank you for coming this evening. And over to you, Sultan. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, I just want to take a minute to thank the Delfina Foundation for inviting me uh, to this uh, to do this collector's residency. Uh, frankly, I never even heard of what a collector's residency is, but I thought it was a wonderful idea, and any excuse to come to London, even though it's uh, rainy and cold, is a great excuse to be here. So, um, the other thing is that I landed this morning, so this is my first event out of a packed week. Aaron, Aaron would tell you that after I proposed five or four or five events, I asked them, can I add one more event? And I think Rose and Aaron said, I think that's enough for your five or six days that you're spending here. Uh, the one last thing I would say uh, before we begin the conversation is, I have a bag uh, here on my right. It has all our publications. These books will be in the Delfina Library. So it has our exhibitions the, uh, from Tehran, uh, from the US, from Paris, from London, and elsewhere. So I do invite you to, are they allowed to go through the library? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. So I do invite you, you. All these lovely people are. I, I, do, I do invite you to take advantage of the fantastic library they have upstairs. They have books on, I mean, for our people, Iranian art, Arab art, Turkish art, art from all over the world. So I do invite you to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, I am really honored and so pleased to be introducing the, uh, uh, my guest here tonight. When I uh, emailed a few weeks ago asking for the possibility of conducting this interview, I, I, I really was already making up excuses for, uh, for, for the guest because of his very, very busy schedule. And I was so happy to uh, receive a positive answer from, uh, from Isabel, who uh, works with him. Thank you very much for uh, all your um, rapid and efficient uh, uh, um, work for, to make this happen. So Saab Eigner is really a, a unique character in the, in the Middle East, uh, someone that I wish we have the ability to clone and replicate because of what he has been doing, championing art, uh, not only from, from our region, from all over, but from all over the world, as you will see, uh, in the course of this interview, um, Fa'ab wears many hats. Uh, his, uh, one of his hats, of course, uh, in Dubai is a, a financier. So we have a, uh, a major financial free zone in Dubai known as the Dubai International Financial Free Zone. Some of you might have heard of it. Uh, there's, I think, hundreds if not thousands of financial companies based there. Uh, Sa'eb actually heads the regulatory uh, organization that oversees that all these uh, financial companies uh, are um, uh, keeping within uh, all the legal boundaries uh, and uh, I must say that uh, it's, I'm sure it's a very very busy job and on the side he has had time to publish uh, a number of books of which uh, this is our uh, topic tonight uh, Art of the Middle East is a book that uh, Saeb Eigner uh, published originally in 2010 and a, an updated version uh, which is the one that's sitting here on the table uh, was published in 2015 so Salab, I'd like to take this opportunity to begin with uh, asking you about this book we have a lot of questions for you but beginning with this book what was the impetus of publishing this book uh, that brings together art uh, from Iran and the Arab world Thank you very much, Sultan, and thank you very much, Delfina, for hosting us this evening. It's very kind, and thank you all for bracing this wonderful weather and making it on a Sunday evening to Delfina. Uh, Sultan, you've been far too kind about me, and uh, Sultan doesn't say what he does, what he's all about, but uh, uh, Sultan is a most wonderful human being who does such wonderful works and has just done a wonderful exhibition in Tehran. Uh, to bridge uh, cultural divides, something that I genuinely believe in. 
the two areas which I try to work very hard on are education and the arts. And the book, Art of the Middle East, the impetus for the book came following an exhibition at the British Museum called Word into Art, uh, in which I had a, a very small contributory role. Uh, and, and from that led, uh, I think, a, 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 a passion to publish something or a publication because at the time there was a void of publication. I know today there are many, and the more the better, uh, but at the time there was perhaps not enough publications that listed many of the great artists and, uh, and art of the region. At the end of the day, the book, like everything we're going to do today, is not about us, it's about the artists, and it's about the art that they produce. Uh, and, and the more that publications there are, the more awareness that there is, and, and, and the more that we know about the art, the more we can support it and follow it and, and, and hopefully uh, allow it to speak for the region. For, for the region is not for many things, uh, of which not many are positive today. Uh, but I hope that at least in the art world, there is a positive message. So uh, throughout the course of this interview, I will go micro and then macro. So we'll dive in and dive out. So before I speak about uh, word into art in which uh, Mr. Sly Wagner did not have a small role to play. In fact, it was one of the leading roles. I'd like to ask about the cover of this book. Can you tell us about this artwork and this artist? And, and who are these figures who, are, who appear on it? What are these lyrics on this? Right, okay. This well, word? this artist uh, uh, is Umkar Thu. Uh, I don't know if everyone in this room... How, how many people know Umkar Thu in this room? Right, almost everybody. So I'm not going to spend any time on Umkar Thu except to say that I have suffered for most of my life, because my mother, who was a writer and author, uh, whilst we lived in London, every morning at five in the morning had Um Kalthum blazing while she had her Turkish coffee and she was writing every morning. Uh, so I was brought up with Um Kalthum's song in my psyche. I can recite almost all of them uh, uh, by heart, uh, only from that very short period. So Um Kalthum is the diva of the Arab world, she had a unifying factor, so it's not that she's from Egypt, she's actually known as the singer of the Arab world for a variety of reasons, during particularly a period of Arab nationalism uh, uh, in the 50s, 60s, and until she passed away in the 70s. Uh, and here, this, this is part of a painting, a much larger painting, which has written on it the names of all of her songs, not all, most of her songs, or many of the ones for which we can we remember her, and every time I look at it, other than the beauty of the piece, uh, the piece which I love, I also remember the suffering that I endured listening to all these songs. But so this is who this person is, and the artist is an Egyptian Armenian artist uh, called Shaw Avedisina, whose uh, who, whose speciality was in stenciling and design, uh, uh, and then has evolved from that to create stencils for which. Uh, the Umkar Thum one, but for many others for which he's known uh, normally on corrugated paper or on textiles. But he's a, not a traditional artist as I would call an artist, he's a design-led artist. Uh, that's showing. Uh, maybe just to add uh, one more thing to what uh, uh, Saeb said so eloquently, um, and I, I'm guessing this is one of the reasons why the work blazes the cover of the book, is that Umkar Thum was also known as the planet of the East. Uh, and so we call her a planet in the in the uh, Arab world. Kaukab al-Sharq. Kaukab al-Sharq, exactly. And there are stories uh, of how uh, apparently she released a song every uh, thir the thir first Thursday of every month. Yeah, well we have with us someone who knows much more than maybe all of us about that period. But I'll introduce him in a minute when his works comes on the screen. I won't do it before. But yes, every, every week when a song was released on a Thursday evening, the Arab world came to a halt. Because everybody sat tuned to their radio and waited for the song. And that's before, of course, internet, and even before television, almost. And everybody was glued to uh, K uh, K uh, Radio Cairo, uh, Sawt al-Arab, Sawt al-Qahira, Sawt al-Qahira, yeah. voice of Cairo. And everybody waited for the latest song. And, and many of the songs we know today, which in Arabic are very famous, whether it's Anta Amri or Latlal or William Saharni, or I can go on and on, were all launched weekly on that uh, channel. Okay, so now you know the secret of why this work is on the cover of, uh, of this book. Um, I want to talk about 
uh, your interest in uh, in uh, art from the Middle East. Have you seen this picture before? No. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't seen this picture before. So this is a, this is a photograph of Saeb Eigner giving a keynote speech on Middle Eastern art at the London Business School uh, in July 2007. Thank you once again, Isabel, for this photo that you found from the archive. I want to ask about your passion. Why is Saeb Eigner so interested in art from the Middle East that you go around to universities, uh, you publish, you help organize exhibitions, and you lecture about art from the Middle East? What drove this passion? Is, is this in any way part of your upbringing? Is this a personal drive? Can you tell us more about that? Sure. With education and university, since, since I'm passionate about both education and art, I try to find a way in, in order to integrate the two. So I, I was a governor for London, of London Business School. I was governor for 10 years. And during this time, there was no art in the university. Uh, I don't know how many people know London Business School, but London Business School is probably the top business school in Europe. Uh, it's one of the top five in the world, repeatedly. Uh, yet there is no art anywhere. If you go now to London Business School, it's full of art. There is art everywhere. Uh, and, and the reason that there is art everywhere, I would hope, is again, I, I and many others played a small role in order to ensure that art is part of the daily uh, life of that school. Although it's a business school, it teaches finance and economics, and business, but I think art is a very important factor. And the art that's on show is international art. So there's a lot of art from the Middle East, from the Arab world and Iran, but also from around the world. And whilst there, I did indeed give this lecture on Middle East art. And they have a very uh, engaged uh, Middle East alumni club also, who uh, does topical talks. But, but it goes along the themes that the importance of showing art and making art part of a daily... Uh, you, you go to lectures, you go to classes, you walk past art. They've just built a beautiful new building, and I suggest you go have a look at it, which is the old Melbourne Town Hall. It's a stunning big building called the Sammy Offer Center. And if you go there, you will see art everywhere and beautifully displayed. And that's part of the dialogue between education and art. I must say that I think it's one of the few institutions that I visit, the few education institutions of which art is everywhere. It's on the staircase, it's in the corridors, it's in the hallways, it's in some of the classrooms. And sometimes you, you feel that there is, in some institutions, a token um, relationship with art. By London Business School, it was literally uh, dotted all over. The, uh, the campus. So let's see what surprise now you've got. What do I have for you? This is this is the the book from the inside. It actually is so beautifully done. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the the layout of the book and uh, uh, the, the captioning and some of the art? I mean, it's so minimalist as well. Uh, it's a, it's such an easy book to 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 look through. Um, did you choose the way that these, these works are uh, highlighted? Well, I chose the works that are in the book, clearly, and the artists that go into the book. And then we had wonderful designers at Merle, and Isabel, who's here, Isabel Koss, who's my, who, who also assisted in the book. Uh, I think the importance is that everything talks to each other. So here you have two Iranian artists. These are done like postcards, and these are all the flowers of Iran. So it's a beautiful work. And then here on the right-hand side, you have someone who is a writer, a musician, and a Reza Dirakshani. And this is, again, uh, uh, to do with the same thing. He's very interested in nature, so he did this work. But the poetry that's written on it, which is very unusual, because it's an Arab poem, mm -hmm. which is a very unusual thing for him to write a mutanabbi on a piece, and he's an Iranian artist. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to show dialogue. And the reason the book covers Arab and Iranian art, and a lot of people ask me why Arab and Iranian, why not only Arab? or only Iranian, mm -hmm. because the two cultures are very much uh, uh, affected by each other. Mm -hmm. And you can't divorce them from each other as such, historically and culturally, mm -hmm. and hence having the two in the same book. But the design and the layout, and minimum, we wanted to give a lot of space. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, you want white walls. Mm -hmm. Even in a, in a place full of art, you need a bit of a breather to allow you to really indulge and look and, and, and spend time on um, at, one, at what point exactly did you decide that you wanted to uh, have a second or an updated version of the book? Because there's several years passed. Sure. What happened in these few years? Well, when we did the first book, uh, the, the publisher, uh, as, as anyone who's written the book will know, you don't really make money from writing books, something my mother told me. 
at a very young age, whenever I said, oh, I'd love to write books. And she said, no, you don't. You don't make money. And you could write book on the sides. But you don't make money from writing books. But my publisher was delighted because the first print run sold out very quickly. We then immediately did the second print run, which also sold out. And then we decided to update the book, I think five or six years later. Uh, and we did a, uh, the, the edition which you've got here. The US wanted it in paperback. Uh, it sells better in the US in paperback for some reason. So we did a very big print run in paperback, which now is also s almost sold out, uh, as well as a hardback copy of the new latest version, which has more artists. Uh, and I think since it was the first publication of the Middle East, what happened is a lot of things came up. A lot of collections we didn't realize. A lot of works suddenly appeared. And we wanted to spend some time actually looking at what we did in the first book and to update it with the second book. There's a lot of pressure to do another edition. We're going to hold off for three years, I think, because we can't just keep every five. We're going to do every six years, it seems. And there's a French edition, uh, L'Art du Moyen-Orient, uh, which has also done very well. And in the first edition sold more than the first English edition. And is just now doing the second edition. Um, if I may, I actually just wanted to uh, read to you a um, fascinating foreword. But before I tell you about the foreword, I'll tell you about an exhibition that we here at the Delfina Foundation are hosting. Uh, I think until the end of the month, Aaron, am I right? Yes. Uh, there's an exhibition downstairs by Ala Yunus, who is uh, an artist that studied uh, the Iraqi cultural, urban, architectural landscape and created two works. One that was originally done in, uh, in 2015 called Plan for Greater Baghdad. And then in 2017 decided to update or create a second version and uh, made uh, a pa plan for feminist, uh, what, how do you call it, Aaron? Feminist Greater Baghdad. Feminist Greater Baghdad. So in that work, in the second version, you have, uh, you have her highlighting a lot of uh, women who were influential in the cultural landscape in Iraq in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. One of these women uh, uh, is Zaha Hadid, the late uh, Iraqi uh, architect, which brings me to the subject of tonight's talk. Zaha Hadid wrote the foreword for this book. People didn't know that, but she wrote the foreword for this book, and I'd like to, may I read the foreword? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's only um, a few lines, so I won't take too long, but I thought it's a nice way of honoring her memory uh, and honoring also the artwork downstairs. So uh, this was written for the original uh, edition in 2010. This book on modern art, on modern and contemporary artists of the Middle East brings together a wide variety of artists from across the region. Their work has evolved with its own characteristic voice, exploring future possibilities yet derived from rich cultural traditions and a timeless history. I was born and lived as a child in Baghdad, where beautiful friezes, paintings, and sculpture were exhibited throughout the city. This work was critical to my own development. I went on to study mathematics in Beirut, at a time when the city was beaming with artistic energy as a center for arts and literature. It is extremely encouraging to see galleries in the West placing contemporary art of the Middle East center stage. Exhibitions at the world's most respected institutions provide a vital forum for the exchange of ideas. Now, nations across the Middle East have invested in their own museums, allowing this work to develop further. Such enlightened patronage, together with intuitive curation, gives us a very promising outlook for the future. And I am pleased to see the region's artists pushing new boundaries and challenging established conventions. It is a very exciting time for Middle Eastern artists. There is a real spirit of innovation and creativity in the air, going beyond established paintings, sculpture, and calligraphy. Their work ventures into new media, film, video, art, and installations that reflect the diverse culture and histories of the Middle East. For millennia, the art of the Middle East has bridged the cultural divide between East and West. This work teaches us that these worlds are not mutually exclusive, but rather layered upon each other and profoundly interlinked. 
art of the Middle East shows us how the artists of the region are continuing this tradition. Zaha Hadid, 2010. Please tell us about this forward and about Zaha Hadid and your relationship with her. A very nice person, a kind person, and a huge heart. Uh, and one of the greatest architects of the 20th, uh, 21st century. And it's really sad she's no longer with us. And what a wonderful testament. A woman, Muslim, from the Arab world, to win the Pritzker, to become a Dane. You know, to, to win all the awards that she, she had. It's, it's one of these wonderful Middle East uh, Arab success stories. Thank you for uh, thank you for including her in this, in this book. I think uh, we're all very pleased. Um, let's carry on. Uh, this is the uh, the work uh, by Shanda Bedesian and Uncle Thum's Greatest Hits, 1977. Uh, pigment and gum Arabic on corrugated cardboard, a triptych of two and a half meters high. Mm. Massive uh, work, a beautiful painting. Great choice for the cover, I think. Um, Yusuf Nabil. Yes, this is, he's, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful Egyptian artist uh, who's based between Paris and New York. He's in, totally in love with Frida Kahlo. Anything, he knows everything about Frida Kahlo and therefore decided to do this work. What Yusuf is, he's a photographer, and he takes these photographs, and then he paints on them with Chinese ink. So this would be a black and white photograph, uh, projected as a black and white photograph, and then everything is painted by hand uh, uh, with, in Chinese ink. And, uh, and, he does, and he's done many works, he's done in Khartoum as well. He's done Zaha Hadid, so it's interesting those two ladies we just talked about. And, uh, and he's one of these, and, and this technique was used a hundred years ago, when you look at old postcards or old photographs, when there was no f color, uh, uh, you couldn't uh, 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 get photographs in color, they were black and white, they would be hand painted in the same technique that he uses now with his art. Thank you. Shadi Ghadirian. Shadi Ghadirian. For those that you might or might not see, there's a Pepsi Cola can flying in the air on the left hand side, uh, just there. Uh, uh, Shadi is one of the early uh, uh, art, uh, photographer artists from Iran who lives in Iran. So many people, when you think Iran and photography, you probably would think of Shirin Neshat. Uh, Shirin lives in New York and she left Iran uh, early on. Shadi makes a point of continuing to live in Tehran. Uh, and her master or her, or her teacher and master is one of the greatest photographers of Iran, Bahman Jalali, who passed away three years ago. Uh, and, and what I like about this, it's a number of series, and this is one of them, is the play really. Behind her, this is a typical backdrop where people go to a studio to take a photograph, either a family photograph or individual photograph. So she, she, that's her in the photograph. So she would sit for herself uh, and have the background as if it's in a photo studio and then have something modern. And in this case, it's a Pepsi Cola can. So it's, it's really a play on Kajar, the Kajar times when they did this photography. Uh, and Kajars were well known for photography because the Shah at the time was very interested in photography in the West and set up a photographic school in Iran at the time. Uh, so I didn't mention that all the works we're seeing here on the screens uh, uh, on the screen are works that feature in the book. Uh, this is Ayman Baalbaki, a Lebanese artist who has, who has won a lot of acclaim in the last few years. Yes, so Ayman, uh, 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 the first piece is the one I'm going to talk about on the left hand side. Uh, and it was an er one of his early works. If I may, since we're recording audio, I have to mention what the work is. This is a work titled Burn It from 2008, and I think it features two tires. That's right, and it has a neon light that says Burn It on it. So you can see the interplay. The background of Burn It is flowers. So you would look at it and say, oh, how wonderful flowers. But actually what's happening, the tires is, are normally burned in demonstrations, and that's the purpose of the tires. And then he puts Burn It a bit cheekily on top of it, uh, just to emphasize that point. Uh, and on the right hand side, as, as, uh, as the boss has now asked me to do, we have Ayman Balbaki with Mulatham. Uh, Mulatham, uh, uh, I walked into his studio and this painting was on the wall. 
and it was already bought or for, it was already sold. I couldn't buy it, but I wouldn't leave the studio. Fahad gets his way in there. <laughs> and, and it hit me. And what, what really hit me when I saw it is when I asked him about the piece. And this was one of the first ones he did, if not the first. And it's him. It's a self-portrait. And he was saying, and here is Ayman sitting, very trendily dressed and, you know, whatever, those that see a photograph of Ayman, and thinking, look, this is me. But what will everyone think when they look at this? They think I'm painting a terrorist or I'm painting someone about to blow himself up. But this is just us. This is how we are. This is what we wear. And this is, and he, I remember him said we wear a kafir. A kafir is, the, is this red uh, uh, checkered. Which, which the Palestinians have become very well known in red and in black. Uh, and Mulatam is the person who covers himself. Uh, and, and it just dawned on him that whenever there was someone trying to deploy something negative, they would put someone uh, looking like this. So he said, so I did a self-portrait and this is me. Uh, it's a lovely piece, although I, 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 I'm still trying to get it to hang at, at SOAS or London Business School. Or you see, very difficult, I can tell you. But, but that is the theme. There's a lot of political undertone to Ayman's works. But you never told us how you got the work. <laughs> uh, I would never leave the studio. And I think in the end he got tired. And we found a way uh, that I got that work. Absolutely. I was not going to leave without that. Work. By the way, I'll tell you something. For the past few years, I know a number of people who have been on waiting lists for, for the Molestam series. This is the most coveted series of uh, Ayman Baalbaki. So, uh, well done for not leaving the studio. <laughs> and fortunately, fortunately, and I'm really pleased about this, Ayman will refuse to paint a Muletha. You know, he did it, he finished it. Now, many other artists, the minute something is popular, they'll keep painting it. And this is really, not, it's not a matter of annoying, it becomes the commerciality of it all. And where he did, he did a lot, and he stopped, and it's finished. Uh, and I think he made the point. It's the same like Burnett. He did Burnett, it was only for one year, and it stopped. He would not do Burnett. Thank you. Oh, goodness. So, one of my most favorite people. We have to put this light off somehow. I don't know how. Because <laughs> this work. May I, may I, may I yes. Yes. Uh, This is a work by uh, Iraqi artist Diya Azawi called Human States Series, Angry Man number one. Okay, I'm going to say something very brief, but I am not the expert on this work. <laughs> I'm actually not the expert on any work. But in this work, on part, in particular, I'm going to introduce you to Dia Azawi, who's with us this evening. And I'm going to <laughs> beg him to very kindly say a few words about the work. Because I saw this work, I'll tell you, and what I saw. Yes. No, no, you have to, absolutely. Please, now you can. What you come up with? And the reason I put the light off is because the depth of darkness in this work is so deep that you have to understand that it is all about darkness. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the work which I had uh, in my last exhibition in Baghdad in 19. 75. After spending about one year and a half in the mountain as a, an officer, a reserve officer, and at that time, the very difficult way of living there, politically uh, targeted by the uh, officers there, and because of most of the officers at that time, even the soldiers, they were nothing to do with the army, all but that we can in Iraq when you finish your school or your university, you go to the army. So I did this collection of work which uh, in a way at the beginning it was the idea is a crime because I used uh, a poem by a very well known uh, poet, Iraqi poet, which was uh, a poet talking about my generation in, in political terms. And this is one of the work which was uh, so I managed to get it uh, from the exhibition, from, from, the, from the Dubai. But uh, uh, it's in a way, it's maybe uh, this is in a manifesto of rejecting the war at that time with the Kurdish uh, Iraqi courts. And the funny side, I was 
most of the time during the night, I listen to the radio, and I listen to the Kurdish radio. And many of my friends talking on the other side. So the, the, the difficulty is how you manage to do something which you can express your feeling about something completely wrong and you cannot say this is wrong. So when I had the exhibition and uh, till now I remember somebody came and he asked who is the artist. I was with uh, uh, Rafa Nasseri and this my Fattah and other two friends. And then I came I said me and then he started asking me with other work because some of the work which I put some of the names and date and then he said, well, what is this name? I said, I was in the so-and-so area and this is the name of a soldier and I felt his eyes blinking and then he said, God help you, got something and he left. And I'm more likely, I think he's somebody who suffers something, either he lost his son or his brother or, or something. So this is in, in a way, uh, till now, I feel this is one of the work which I, I feel proud because it will, maybe after five years, ten years, twenty years, it will express the situation in Iraq at that time, during the 70s. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This work uh, uh, is a masterpiece. Thank you, uh, Sultan. Yes. So I would so love guess to... who owns it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing this work, and Dia happened to be there. And I walked in, and there was this exhibition, and the work was there, and Dia was there. And I went to Dia, and I said, Dia, I am going to ask you for one thing. I've never asked you for anything. He said, anything you want. I said, I want this work. And he said, oh dear, this is a bit challenging. <laughs> and he went and he came and I wouldn't leave. And by the end of the day, we There's had a pattern the there. <laughs> we had this work. And, and just this work, I, I, I shouldn't put the light off, but I'm going to ask the light off for one second, because I just want to show you. To me, the anguish in this person, the sort of depth, real deep, deep depth, darkness, uh, and, and it is almost someone who wants to say so much, but is silent, he can't. So imagine that you cannot scream, you cannot shout, but you want to do it. And when I look at it, it's like the famous scream. Uh, or it is like one of these haunting Francis Bacon's, if I may say so. I'm not creating a correlation here. But it just created such immediate connectivity. And, and, and the depth of feeling of that human being, to me, was just profound. And I do not know if the red denotes blood, but I just saw that he is screaming, and below him was a river of blood, of all that is happening at the time. So they are, I'm touched, uh, and I know that you're emotional at that moment, and I'm sorry, but I am really touched that you were here, you are here, uh, that we can share this really rare, moment to want to be able to get there, yeah, but to get him and his work and Sultan, all of us here uh, <laughs> this evening. We are, we are very grateful for, uh, and, uh, and they are for both of you for, uh, for being here. And you're right, you did have to switch the light off to admire this work. Yes. yes, um, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Thank you. Yes, so here we have uh, a couple of works. Uh, uh, one is by a uh, Egyptian German artist. Um, called Susan Hafuna. Susan Hafuna, and the other one is by a Syrian artist called Yusuf Abdelki. That's correct. That's absolutely right. And here on the right hand side, clearly you can see this is all about Tahrir Square, and it's all about the Egyptian, uh, 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 the Arab Spring, uh, 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 no longer a spring, I would say, in a very deep dark winter. But uh, it's Tahrir Square, uh, and this artist is actually a photographer, Susan, uh, originally from Germany, Dusseldorf, and, and Egypt, and does some most wonderful photography. And then she went on and she uses mashrabiyas. Mashrabiya is a wood uh, that is used like a trellis in the old days in the windows. does two things. One, it, it protects you from the light, from the sun, but also allows you to see outside without the outside seeing inside. 
So if someone came to propose to a lady, the lady could see him, but he actually cannot see her. So it's a sort of one-way mirror of its time. And she uses these trellises to these, these wonderful works. And Abdelki does the most wonderful draftman uh, and charcoal works and pencil works. Uh, and this is a wonderful piece, which we had hoped at the time was a short period of a Syrian crisis that continues sadly to be with us uh, to today. So I noticed that there is a political uh, element to this page. Some of the works are very political, as the one that uh, Ria Azawi uh, spoke about in the previous slide. So did you have uh, any qualms about including political works? This book is being sold across the region. Uh, were there any works that you didn't include because they're too political? Not really. I mean, I remember a museum director whom I, whom I admire and respect, so it's not being critical of the comment he make at all. And, 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 but he did say, why is there so much politics in Middle East works? I mean, if you live in the Middle East and you're an artist, how can you be devout of politics or conflict? Or, I mean, what do you do? Just paint red roses every day. I mean, it just doesn't work, right? So I think uh, politics is a very important factor in the book. Uh, it's thematically done, so there are seven chapters. Uh, and one of them is clearly uh, uh, conflict uh, and rules. Uh, but the, the Middle East is driven at the moment by politics. But, but the work are not all political. So this is not the, the, but a lot of the works have a political connotation, particularly for those living there. Jamal Tata, who is a uh, Fra French-based Algerian origin artist. This is a giant triptych. Um, I actually love his work and I must admit that I learned so much from your book. This is one of the artists that I acquired for the foundation after finding his work in the art of the Middle East. Oh, how lovely. Good. Uh, 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 this is a work, this typically shows uh, uh, somewhat the despair of youth. So this is a young person they just finished, presumably, school or university. Uh, and, and I think that maybe the, the connotation here is perhaps he's originally from Algeria or from North Africa, which in France, as you know, there's a lot of people from the Maghreb, from that part of the world. And things are not that easy for immigrants. Uh, and, and I think what, what he tried to do here, the reason maybe for the color background, there's another triptych where it's black. And with the black one, it's easier to show a negative thing. Here he's saying, look, maybe there is hope. Maybe, you know, there is something to be done. And I do wonder, having seen his son once at an exhibition recently in a museum, and his son was there, it looked cannily very similar to his son. So I wonder whether this is actually his son uh, that he's trying to portray in that painting. I actually uh, spoke to him on the phone once. I had Gilles Capel over at my house and uh, Gilles Capel uh, called him and said, here, speak to the artist. And then he only spoke French, so I was forced to speak with him. And you're right, it does depict or does reference the despair, the isolation, uh, almost, you know, these people who have given up on a, on, on a future, living in the banlieue, living in the suburbs. Uh, of Paris, uh, fantastic artist, I think not very well known uh, um, in, in Algeria and in the uh, Arab world. Uh, this is a slide showing uh, uh, works that are <laughs> incredible. Uh, Kamil Yahyawi, uh, a type writer. Uh, I actually didn't know this artist uh, except through your book, so okay. please tell us more about yeah, uh, Kamil, Yah Kamil Yahyawi the last time. Uh, I went and saw him. He, he lives truly like an artist. I went and saw him. I walked up the stairs. I went up with the, my wife. We walked up five flights. There's no lift. We got there and he sort of forgot that we had an appointment and suddenly these scantily dressed women sort of disappeared and they're all totally chaotic. Place. Please do not share that story. Uh, and, 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 and then I, so I spent a wonderful couple of hours and, and he knows so much about French literature, Arabic literature uh, 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 and he's one of these much deeper artists than one could have thought of and this work has just come back, it was on loan in Brazil this is how it was exhibited I believe in, in Brazil with the picture above and, and this table and the typewriter and, and it, it, it is in reference to a poet, uh, Tahar Jawi and these are bullets as you can see and it also talks about uh, 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 
how a lot of the writers and journalists of their time were persecuted uh, and in many countries continue to be persecuted because they cannot say what they want to say and they are sadly uh, uh, shot or, or imprisoned or whatever. But this is more a reference to a period of time where there was particular persecution. Um, so which country is he from? Uh, Al 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 Algeria. Algeria. Okay. Lives in Paris. Lives in France. So uh, this is a, uh, a slide showing two images from uh, the exhibition uh, Word into Art that took place in the British Museum in 2006. Um, I will let you speak about it, uh, but I have, I have a couple of questions about this, uh, this exhibition. Um, do you want to talk about the artwork before I ask you about the exhibition? Sure, of course. Again, this is Dea Azawi. Sit with us uh, in the front row here. Uh, there was a BBC program made about this piece and how this piece was put together. This is a, a very large monumental piece. Uh, it's it's all based on, uh, on uh, Muhammad Mehdi Jawahi's poem, uh, uh, poetry. Sorry, and it's a beautiful poet, uh, 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 O Blessed Tigress. And it was the, the, the pivotal, most important piece, and it became the postcard piece for the British Museum exhibition. Uh, and World into Art was the groundbreaking exhibition uh, and the first one which to have depicted so many artists from the Middle East in a West, or well, in any museum, but in a Western museum. So, a few words about World into Art. This, is, this was, as Mr. Slav Aynar said, uh, a very important groundbreaking exhibition. It started here in the UK in October 2006. It brought together over 90 artists from the uh, Middle East. Uh, and almost 90,000 visitors uh, saw this exhibition. Uh, after London, it traveled to Dubai, where it was also met with uh, uh, you know, equal acclaim. So uh, tell us a little bit about this exhibition. Um, I know that you played a major role in realizing it and traveling it to the Middle East. Uh, how important was it? Uh, the title, Word into Art, so does calligraphy have something to do with this? It was, it was not calligraphy per se, although calligraphy was part of it. It's, the effect, it's how words or letters were used in art. So it's not a calligraphic exhibition, but it is an exhibition about the use of word in art. Uh, it was uh, the idea of the director and curator at the British Museum, Neil McGregor. We've, 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 but we've never had an exhibition of modern, modern. Uh, art from the Middle East until this exhibition came uh, came together and some of the artists had never been shown before in a museum setting so this was really their pivotal moment in their career so uh, I mean, congratulations on putting this show together and uh, almost a dozen years ago now believe it or not yes I know and and uh, as you said many of the artists were shown for the first time at this exhibition so many artists were not known never heard of never left I would say half the artists. And if I'm not mistaken, the Great Court was almost just completed. Correct. It was just it's a Norman Foster extension, just completed, and Dia's work was in the Great Court, as you can see in yeah. the entrance, as you go up to the exhibition. Okay, let's see what else do we have. So this slide depicts one of my favorite artists, a, a scholar, an artist, uh, one of the, uh, I think, um, artists that brings together generations. Uh, uh, of Iraqi artists from the 1950s all the way to the early 2000s. Shakir Hassan al Said, untitled, from 1996. Tell us about this work, about Shakir. Uh... I mean, Shakir Hassan is known for, for many works, but they're, they're all uh, uh, abstract works, if, if that's what. If, if, in, in the context of that type of abstract work, uh, he comes from the collection of these great modernist artists, of which Dia, of course, is one, and Jawad Salim, and Shakir Hassan, and, and many others. Uh, and I, and I want, there are, he, he's known for many better works than this one, uh, but I wanted to depict this one because this one, in, in its simplicity, is complex. So it's not a very large work, it's a small work, but it, the simplicity of the work to me created the dynamics of the complexity of his thinking and of his mind and his work. And he has one of his students, actually, uh, uh, who Dia introduced me to, called uh, Hannah Manala, 
who in his spirit and works now lives in London and also produces some of Shackle's work. But he's one of the first great artists of the 60s that produced for the Middle East, for the time in the Middle East, what I would call very modern, very avant-garde time, uh, time works. So this is a slide showing Farhad Moshiri, greetings to you all morning from yeah. 2003. Yes. Oh, and another one is a Nightingale song. Yes, so Farhad Moshiri uh, is, is one of Iran's uh, wonderful contemporary artists who tries to also, other than he has a lot of quiet, uh, makes fun of a lot of things, he also respects great, greatly the tradition of Iran. And in doing so, he has in these paintings makes tradition, the jaw, a very Iranian pottery. And then when you see it, you think it's actually pottery, the way he paints it. And he bakes it, so he puts the used to, in the early days, when he did the works early on, and this is a 15-year-old work, so it's early on, he would bake them on the roof of his house in uh, Tehran. And he puts poetry, uh, in this case by Hafiz, uh, one of the great poets of Iran of the 13th century, and on the left-hand side, I can't spell it very well in Iranian, but I think it says, A Subh, O uh, Morning, Salam Bertu, O morn, Morning Greetings to you. Uh, and, and he does that, just, it's a, just a cheerful, wonderful message. And, and most of his paintings have something to do with love, positive, undertone of old Iranian poetry and old Iranian traditions. He's known now for many poppy type of art, but I think the art I like is the one that he really started him, which is in that spirit. Of the record, I agree. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, one of the artists uh, who was also, uh, although he was famous from before World Into Art, I think uh, achieved critical acclaim after the World Into Art exhibition, Hassan Masoudi, three works dating uh, from 2006 to 2008. I picked these three works because Hassan is a wonderful human being. He's a just wonderful man. He's from Iraq uh, and he lives in Paris. Uh, and the British Museum decided to depict a detail of his work on the front of the World Into Art catalog, which has propelled him uh, because of it. He, 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 he is a very kind and generous artist. Every time I go see him, he gives me a piece of work. And, and I'm now embarrassed to go and see him. Or I try to see him somewhere but not in his studio, uh, and, and he, he likes to, he loves poetry, he loves Iraqi poetry, but he loves poetry in particular, but he likes poetry of the world, so he would choose like the first one there, Chief Seattle is a Red Indian, very well known uh, poem, Confucius of course we know, and Gibran, Gibran Khalil Gibran, but he picks many, and he does his simplistic, so he's, tra he's trained traditionally as a calligrapher, but he's no longer a traditional calligrapher. He's now an artist that uses calligraphy, which is different from the traditional calligraphers. But he has a lovely flow. He's a wonderful uh, type of guy. <coughs> He's, he, uh, Hassan now is, I think, in his mid to late 70s uh, and, and lives in Paris, as I said. So this is a slide showing the work of uh, an artist called Parviz Tanavoli, and uh, it depicts the character Heech. From 1970, I'll let Saya tell you what Heech is, but this is a very important work. Yes, this work is given, it's at, actually at London Business School, in the old building in Regent's Park. Uh, I shouldn't say old building, but anyway, in what is not the new extension, but a new building. Heech, uh, I had a discussion with Pervis Tenofoli, because everyone wrote Heech means nothing, uh, which probably phonetically is correct, but the point of in pure translation is correct, but to me, Hitch, like Dia's painting and the black background, the depth of the meaning is much more important. And in a big discussion with Tanafuli, I elected in my book to call it nothingness, not nothing. And in the end, Parviz agreed, and he sent me a note that he agreed, because nothing means nothing, right? It's so irrelevant. But actually, in, in Persian, there is much more than nothing. This is a deep nothing. So there is a void. There is like, a, and when I when you see something that is that is dark, how can you paint something black, but do it so black that it has depth? And it's the same with nothing. This is nothingness. 
So it is a very deep meaning. And Tanavur has become very famous for Hitch and for his Hitches. Uh, and this is made in five across. This is a very large piece. And it's in uh, London Business School. Um, when you say it's in London Business School, uh, yeah. do, do, do you know if we are allowed to visit in the public? Yeah, you can. Visit? Yeah, I'm sure you can. I mean, the London Business School is a charity education institution. This is outside, so you can just go see it, I guess. But I suppose to be safe, one can send them an email to say we're coming to visit, and, and I'm sure they, they, they should have no issue. Okay. Because it's a charity, yes. uh, it's a charitable institution, and it receives public funding, and normally they are open. But there is always security concerns yes. as such, I okay. guess. Thank you. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite uh, mm. artists. Uh, it's a work by an Iranian artist called Hadiye Shafir titled uh, Transition. Um, tell us about this work. Tell us about what's in mm. this. So the, Hadi Shafi is an Iranian artist who lives in New York. Uh, and this work depicts, you see all of these little circle things. So all of this is written on them, a message. And in the old days, you would write these papers, you would scroll them and put them in the wall. And the wall will be full of these uh, messages. Uh, and this one depicts love. And all of these, if you unroll this thing, it's all written on it. She's written, and then she rolls it roll and sticks it in the wall. And these here are pages of paper, and also there is written on it the message. But this is a monument, this is a very large, it's one and a half meters, it's a huge uh, and very important piece of Hadi Shafi. And it touches on all the new, so it touches on the old tradition of writing, putting in walls, and, and more for wishing or blessing someone or wishing something to come true, or they went to, a, you know, to somewhere where a saint was born or someone religious was buried, and, and they would do that as part of a pilgrimage and so on. Saeed, this is basically hundreds of meters correct. Yard of the word Ashq, 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 love. Ashq. So correct. she literally writes it with she her does. hand Absolutely. over and over and over. Correct. Yeah. You, did you open one of them to check that it says Asha? Uh, no, but I can, I can see they say, if you look actually here, you yes. will see, do you see uh, Asha? Yes, of course, you see on the sides, yes. Ash, all of us. And I, I'm sure, she, she, she's a very sincere artist, I'm, I'm sure it's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a torturous thing to do, I mean, I'm sure you can just imagine. <laughs> okay, so let's see what's coming up next. This is a, a okay. stunning work. Uh, the slide depicts Khaled Zeki's work. This is, these are uh, very large and I, and I know in, enormously heavy pieces. Isabel was in the studio there in Italy. This is in Italy. Uh, and the studio is all next to a foundry where also this work was done in bronze, which is where Botero does. Botero is one of the, I don't know if you know Botero, but he does sort of, his bronzes in Spain and in Italy, and, and it's next to this studio. But this is in a village in Italy where everyone does all the sculptures uh, in marble. This is in granite, and this is a Sufi dervish. Uh, in, in Sufism, uh, the, the whirling dervish are the ones who go around and around. Maybe some of you saw, and they were normally white with a, with a fist. Uh, and this is a granite piece. Uh, and they're not identical, they're similar. They look like they're two copies. They're not. But he worked on those two pieces in Italy, uh, in black. And he's an Egyptian artist, uh, Khalid Zaki. How, how big is this work? 2.1 meters. Okay, so it's taller than uh, a person. Yes. Yeah, taller than a person. So it's supposed to be above, to be <coughs> down at you. And if you see, he looks down at you. So when you stand, it's actually very imposing as a piece of art. It's a beautiful work. Well, I have a small version of it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but this is really beautiful. Okay, let's see what's coming up next. Sorry, I these. This is just something else. <laughs> just something out of this world. It's a, it's a, a slide that uh, shows Shafi Aboud. Tell us about yes. Shafi Aboud, maybe for a minute before you tell us about. Well, Shafi Aboud. I mean, they yeah, would know Shafi uh, well. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, Shafi was was a very, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Everyone liked Shafiq Aboud. He was a very nice, very jolly, very happy, very kind, very simple uh, artist. And I think among the Lebanese artists, really, he's one of the great artists. And he had no pompousness or he had no airs and graces. He just liked painting. He liked people. He enjoyed a nice time. 
Uh, and there are two paintings which I, I really enjoyed. Uh, uh, and, and there's a lovely story. One is this one, and one is in Qatar, in Doha. It's a black painting with a red, it looks like a fire in it. And when I went and visited the beautiful museum in Doha and their beautiful collection at the time, the curator was explaining me about the painting. And, uh, and it was a new curator, and what he was saying was not uh, really true, but I just sort of tried to find a diplomatic way. So I stopped him in his flow to say, oh yes, I know a bit about the painting, let me tell you what I know about the painting, because I knew he was digging a hole for himself. And he said, well, what do you know? And I said, well, this is a painting uh, that he did for his dealer at the time, a very famous uh, dealer. Uh, who was the dealer there? Who was the early the dealer who moved from Beirut? Faris. Faris. So Faris always accepted, I want one meter by one meter. It's very easy to sell. And don't do anything silly. Just do one meter by one meter. Uh, and you know, and that's what I want. And I want this color or that color, because he knew what to sell. And he did this beautiful painting, red, and Shafiq loved it. And then uh, the galleries came, and he said, wow, this is going to sell. This will be the first one to sell from the 15, because everyone will love this red. He went the next day, and Shafiq overnight painted it all black. And left only little red, because he was so annoyed that the one meter, one meter red will sell. And that's why I said this story. And then in this one, he did it, and then he decided, I want to put my hand in the painting. Now, it's the only one he's put his hand on, and it's the only one that exists, I suppose, with his DNA. This is unusual. Very unusual. Absolutely unusual. Yeah, as, the, as they say, it's an unusual word. Yeah, this is the only one. There's no Lama. Uh, yeah, did. but thanks to Faris, who encouraged him to do a lot of work. Normally, he used to do work which is about 50, 50 by 60. By 50. Uh, exactly. Yeah, but he is the one who pushed him and Adam Ahmed yes. to do some work, more serious work actually. Now, I mean, now the most important work or uh, painting of Shafiq is uh, the large one. The, large the one, one, the red one, it is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose, I suppose you agree with his uh, choice too. Yeah, and the wonderful thing, and that's why it's a lovely vignette to have there with us, because you're living through history. You're living through a period <laughs> where now we hear about it, but now we actually, he lived it. So he was with Shafiq and with all of them telling these stories. And the title of this work is? La Main, the, the Hand. And it's from the year? 1969. Okay. Wonderful. It's a great work. Congratulations to whoever has it. <laughs> I will, I'll let you guys guess. <laughs> <laughs> this is just another fantastic work. This uh, slide depicts the work of an artist called Paul Geragosian. And the Sultan just opened yesterday, only because I saw it on Instagram, an exhibition of Paul Garagosian in Sharjah uh, and he flew overnight to come here not for me at all uh, <laughs> but to, to do this residency and this is the catalogue of the exhibition he did in Sharjah of this artist and he did a wonderful exhibition and this artist normally does iconography in churches when he started in the 50s uh, I know everyone thinks he's Lebanese which he is Lebanon adopted him he's a Palestinian artist born in Jerusalem and used to uh, paint for churches, uh, the, the, the iconographies and the silhouettes. And then he moved to Lebanon where he's lived ever since. And this one is called Rebirth, and it's about a child. And maybe if I tell you this, you can see there's a child in white in the center. This is the baby, and it's the mother holding her baby and showing it to her girlfriends. So these are all the girls looking at the new birth, a newborn. Uh, uh, and it's a very... It is a lovely work. Congratulations to whoever has this paint. <laughs> you can see there's a trend here. <laughs> so yes, we have that one of the catalogs that I brought with me is uh, the exhibition catalog. Um, it will be in the library. It will be in the library and I want to say that we, we got some uh, incredible loans. We borrowed works from His Excellency Dr. Anwar Gergash. We borrowed works from His Excellency Zaki Nusaybe, uh, you, the cultural advisor of Sheikh Zayed. We borrowed works from her Highness Sheikh Salam bin Hamdan, the wife of Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, a private collection, and uh, Mr. Abdurrahman Al-Awais, His Excellency, Minister, Foreign Minister of Culture, now Minister of Health, and so many other people uh, who know this works. Uh, so I do hope you take a look at the catalog.
Let's see what's coming up. This is also another incredible, uh, I think, uh, masterpiece. Uh, we will hear more about it. This is a work by the artist Luay Kayani. Now, the, the reason this is a very rare work is because Luay Kayani, one of the two great, well, there are many great Syrian artists, but one of, if you were to say Fatah Mdarras and Luay Kayani, maybe, and there are many others, of course, but they're the two great artists. In this one, it is rare because in the background is Ma'lula. Ma'lula is this Christian village. I don't know if many of you know about it, but in the news there was a lot because uh, ISIS and Daesh were trying to destroy Ma'lula and then it was protected. And this artist does three themes normally. Ma'lula, flowers, and people, figurative. And in this painting, the only it's the only painting known of Kayali to have all three in one. The boy, the flower, and Ma'lula. And in that context, it's such a special, really, uh, painting. And when you see it, and you look at the face of this child, you can almost cry. Seriously, I have never been as saddened looking at something. I looked at this boy, and he's crying for Ma'lula, for Syria, for happiness. And you look today at Syria, and you think, God, it's almost like he projected what is going to happen today. It's such a powerful piece. I mean, um, we have one of the Ma'lula works, and we have a figurative work, but this is something I've never seen before. So congratulations to whoever wins this. Uh, <laughs> um, one other thing is, uh, as, as Saeb said, that uh, uh, the artist obviously referencing Syria in 1973, from what I understand was that following the, uh, the occupation of the Golan Heights, the artist fell into a depression uh, in 1967 and took some time off. Uh, he was not painting for some time. And then when he came back to painting, a lot of the works had taken a somber, a very sober, and also sad uh, uh, turn, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. He did, it's not here. He did a very famous painting. He did one painting in 19, after the war in 67, uh, Ummahat al-Shuhada, which is not very large, but it is also one of these you could tell. What does it mean? And it had uh, the model of the martyrs. And it has the Golan Heights at the bottom. He, picked, he did the Golan Heights and he did mothers. And then he had uh, yeah. martyrs. You know, these are all so important in reference point mm -hmm. to what happened at a period in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if this was painted in 73 after the war or before the war. Okay. Before. Okay. Before. Let's see what's coming up next. Oops. So the, this is the, the artist that um, Saab just referenced. He said there are two great artists from Syria, or there's many great artists from Syria, but two that uh, he mentioned were Luay Kayali and Fatah Mudarras, which is depicted in this slide. Tell us about this work, please. Yeah, this, this, there are, he did two of these paintings, this one and a large monumental one. And, uh, and this one is, I mean, they're rare for Fatah Mudarras to do the countryside in the context of that type of thing. And that's in the mountains and villages where he comes from, where Fatah was brought up. And that's right. And where he used to. Oh, sorry, just to repeat the comment. He He's a Kurdish. He's a, he was a Kurdish. Even, artist. even with all this figurative work, you can't hear it. Kurdish. Kurdish. Absolutely. Somebody said that. Oh, really? They don't? Yeah. But he said it in a video. In a video, he a said. Video he mentioned yes. that he yes. said that point yeah. about right. Kurdish. Right. And. Uh, he used to love the countryside, he used to love the mountains, and he used to say, we used to run in the prairies, but we didn't know what is Kurdish, what is Syrian, what is, they were just prairies. Uh, and he made the comment at the time that he made it, you make reference today, because why did he say there is no difference between Kurdish or Syrian in the prairie? He said that, Bayan al-Hukul, he said, when we ran in between the prairies, we didn't distinguish between Kurdish and Syrian. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these works were early, but they resonate today for what is happening today in the region. Um, next, we have a work by an artist called, Moroccan artist called Farid Belkahir. Tell us what is the meaning of Ah, ah yeah. Bala, So Bala. this work, when I first saw it, I remember I was with Farid, I looked at this, I actually thought it was a dog. So I looked at it, and you can't blame me. I mean, I looked here, and it looked like a dog, right? Ears and mouth and so on. And he kept, you know, look and look and look. What is this? Really dog, camel, horse. It's actually a tree. It's a tree that's native of Morocco. It's an African tree. 
and it's, it, it, it creates shape, it allows the sheep and goat to go under it, and that's why I love the work, because it really resonated for him, and it's made of, uh, of natural pigments of skin. So he is very much to do also with nature, using pigments, and I love the Damien Hirst at a square, uh, 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 which are on it, done before Damien Hirst, of course. <laughs> this is the 1989 painting. And this piece was in the World Into Art exhibition mm -hmm. uh, of the British Museum. It's a bronze piece, and Adam Hneem is one of the great sculptures, or, or great modern sculptures of Egypt, still uh, with us today. Of the Arab world, sorry, of the Arab world, thank you, they are for correcting me. And of the Arab world, he is really the, the greatest living. Sculpture. And, and this is the same uh, character or the same figure yes. of the lady who appears on the cover of the book and who, who I talked about in the beginning. And this is very typical of her because she used to have a brooch always and she had a handkerchief and this is depicted in this one and she had her long earrings coming down and her hairstyle. So this is very much uh, um, the way it's depicted. Wonderful work. So we uh, close now with this painting. We're gonna, we're gonna close with Q and A, maybe. Oh, but sorry, <laughs> it was the presentation. <laughs> if you guys want Q and A, right? But this is this is not a Middle Eastern name. No, Jose Parla. Yes. So Jose Parla is a New York-based artist, uh, born in Miami, Cuban okay. origin, American artist, very well known and famous today. He won the commission a few years ago, the replacement of the Twin Towers, is Freedom Tower. Huge competition for an American artist to do a huge piece at the entrance. He won the commission, it's a 10 piece piece in the entrance of Freedom Tower. So the reason I say this is because he's a well-known artist. So I went, the, the way I connected with him, uh, I was sent uh, by my wife to go to a gallery called Ems Lester. Ems Lester sells Banksy, street artists largely, or urban artists, I don't like to call them street artists. And I went to see uh, this painting, uh, which I had acquired, and as I was there, this artist comes in and tells the gallerist, oh, I have just been to the British Museum, fantastic exhibition, and he was holding the word into art catalogue, mm -hmm. and I was standing there, I didn't say anything. He said, now I understand why I keep going like this. And he said, why? He said, it's all to do with this Arabic letters. Mm -hmm. And turns out his great-grandfather went from Syria to Cuba. And then from Cuba they moved to Miami. And he's always felt there is something to do with Arabic letters. And he said he had a girlfriend, uh, or boyfriend, or I think girlfriend, who was Tunisian or Moroccan. And she gave him an Ta'umri which is one of the seminar, very famous songs of Umta Um Kaltum, yeah. means you are my life. And he said, I kept listening to it, and he said, it's mesmerizing, because she keeps repeating herself. He said, I don't know what she's saying, but he listened to it, and he painted Anta Umri. So when I saw Anta Umri, I thought, well, this is linked to the Middle East, it's clearly affected by the Middle East, and therefore, I put it as the last painting in the book. Hence a diary, and that's why I wanted to close to show this Jose Parla piece. So you begin with Don Kelthoum, and I end with Don Kelthoum. That's why I told you I've been tortured. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can understand why. So, uh, can we keep a couple of questions? Of course you can. So, whoever has a question, please put up uh, your hand. Yeah, I would actually want to start with yes. um, to get the first question to Rose Lejeune, <laughs> who is the <laughs> associate curator of our talks program here for Collecting as Practice. Oh, thanks, Sarah. While I do so, I'm going to hand over this catalog of Word to Art, which of oh, course wow. is in the Delphina Library upstairs. Oh, <laughs> to add to the collection. Very here. rare, yes, oh. indeed. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> so yeah, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Actually, I did have one thing that I was thinking of. Thank you, first of all, for a really fantastic, I mean, just series of amazing artworks and kind of the way of moving through a whole series of different kind of practices has been really wonderful. Um, through the presentation, there's been, for me, what's been really interesting, you, you mentioned the British Museum show and then 
the, the, the kind of um, some of the ways that some of those works have travelled. And I guess one of the questions that I was thinking about several of the works that you described was about an idea of interpretation and then an idea of audience and whether or not it's possible, I mean, both in terms of um, some, of the, some of the artworks that you've been talking about here, but also maybe, for example, in terms of thinking about the Bargeo collection and its um, recent kind of uh, manifestation at the Whitechapel Gallery here in London. And I guess I wanted to ask both of you a little bit about that idea of um, interpretation and audiences and what happens when these works travel between these different contexts and, and how they get described differently and how you think that that um, kind of maybe... Uh, enhances the, the conversation about those works. Yes. No, you go. <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you maybe, uh, I'll give you an example here uh, of using the, uh, the Iran uh, exhibition, our exhibition that took place in Tehran uh, in the fall of 2016. Um, we had taken 40 artworks from the Arab world uh, these are not Arab artists, but these are artists who came from the Arab world, some of whom were um, Turkmen Arab, Kurdish Arab, Armenian Arab, Amazigh Arab, uh, Armenian Arab, Jewish Arab, uh, and other, and other uh, uh, minorities, so many other minorities. So what we did with that exhibition was the works were placed in different galleries. There was a couple of galleries that were exclusively Iranian works, because there were 40 from our collection and 40 from the Iranian collection. And there was a, there was some spaces where the works were mixed together, and so it was interesting to uh, to see. I, I, I was told how people could not differentiate between what's an Arab artwork and what's an Iranian artwork, but also uh, some Iranian viewers, uh, you know, looking at the work, identified things that they felt that that they connected with, uh, and this is something that we see when the works travel to other destinations, whether, whether these individuals come from minorities, whether this artwork talks about identity, whether this artwork talks about uh, issues that relate to the, the viewer herself or himself. So it's a, I think it's a very uh, a good question and I'd love to hear uh, Saeb's uh, answer. Uh, it is the point that when an exhibition travels to another geography or another country, is the audience in that, how that audience sees it in the context of where it is, right? Uh, so I, I guess if you took a piece that is typically of the Middle East, it's very different than you took one that isn't. So if you took a, 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 a Shafiq Aboud, which is an abstract, and whenever you take it around the world, I think sort of the way they see it is the same, genuinely, if it's an abstract one. The one who did the, the hand, right? Yeah, yeah. excluding the hand. Yeah. If you took a Shafiq, <laughs> just a Shafiq, I would not doubt that. Right? Uh, and I think even showing the hand, the wittiness of the hand, yes. could be explained anywhere around the world. If you took a manifestly political, and the same artist, so let's say, or let's say Dia, since we have Dia with us. So Dia does the most wonderful abstract and can travel around the world, and it's an abstract work by Dia Zawi. Then you can take Sabra and Shatila. Right, which is now as part of the Tate collection, which depicts the massacre of Sabra and Shatila in Beirut, clearly a very political piece, will be seen and looked at in contextually differently around the world where it is being seen. Moletta is another good example. Moletta seen in New York will be different than Moletta seen in Hong Kong, or in Mumbai, or in Moscow, or in Paris, in or in London, or, or, or in Beirut. Or in Beirut. So, yes, I think the Middle East, the, the big thing with the Middle East, perhaps, is the effect, the, the social, political, and economic effect on the works, but more the political effect and conflicts and war, uh, largely, and strives and, and social on, on the work, I feel. Let's speak into the mic, please, so that we can yes. record. Yes, yes. speak. Uh, yeah. uh, since you have a good uh, connection with uh, Dubai, uh, as far as I remember, it was sponsored exhibition and uh, the British Museum was sponsored by somebody there. Mm -hmm. So why don't do your best to get something like Saatchi? Mm -hmm. I mean, we need, I mean, a lot of Arabs buying a lot of houses here. 
a lot of investment. Yeah, because they buy, they buy everything, and they, I think you know, and you know that too. Why not to spend a bit of million rather buying a house, <laughs> buying something to, yeah, to to show that uh, Arab culture or Arab art, creative work, more than put more money on horses, more money in the uh, uh, building. Yeah. Well, they are, why, why would I not have expected a controversial? <laughs> no, it's not. It's been very naive of me not to have expected. So we can mute that question. In the <laughs> yeah. Dia, you raise a very good point, but I think what we can say with a degree of confidence is from where there was no awareness or engagement or, or support of culture and the arts, the Middle East has come a very long way. I think it's fair to say this where you now see exhibitions being sponsored, where you see something like the Barjil Foundation doing wonderful works, where others are encouraged by the Jamil Foundation, by the Barjil Foundation. The more that things like this happen, the more others will come up. I, I would say that state-sponsored or state-supported should that doesn't excite me as much as you mentioned, Sachi. Sachi is an individual. He did something exciting. It's, uh, it's an event. Absolutely. So I think we will see more and more individuals. More and I hope we will see more and more individuals. We see it in Sultan. We see it in Jamil, as I said. And there will be others. Okay. So uh, please join me in thanking our guest speaker. Thank you.